Uh, okay. Okay, hi everyone. We're uh, really happy to be here with you all today. Um, my name's Ayla. I am coming to you from the National Farmers Union up in Canada. Uh, I farm about six hours directly north of here in eastern Ontario. Um, and I've got Jean Simon and Ian here as well. Um, I'll let you guys introduce your, yourselves, explain a little bit about who you are. Uh, are we going to those chair? I think that was a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a plan. Hola, eh, my name is Ian Pagan. I'm from Puerto Rico, member of Organización Boricua of eh, Agroecological Farming and coordinator of Proyecto Agroecológico El Osco Bravo that we are working with a school of agroecology at the island. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jean Simon. I come from Quebec, so maybe I will switch in French during the presentation. Just wave me if, if I do that. I'm sorry about it. Uh, I'm president of Centre Paysan, which is a school of agroecology in Quebec. And uh, we practice the Campesino a Campesino methodology. And we are linked to an uh, international web network of School of Agroecology of La Via Campesina. Yeah, thank you. So we are all members of the La Via Campesina, which I'll explain a little bit about the history of the, of the movement there. Um, but I also wanted to mention that we're here as part of a, a larger group um, of people that are participating in a process that we're calling the People's Agroecology Process. Um, which involves members of La Via Campesina uh, and the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance um, and a few others that are working on a grassroots project to scale out agroecology in North America. So we are operating in uh, the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico um, for now. Um, we have the National Farmers Union, which is my organization. Uh, Union Paysan is here. Um, <laughs> Sandra Paysan, which are related organizations in Quebec in Canada, uh, the Organisation Boricua from Puerto Rico, uh, Community to Community Development in, from a, a farm worker support organization in Bellingham, Washington, uh, Black Dirt Farm Collective, the Farm Worker Support Committee, uh, CATA, which operates in uh, New Jersey, Eastern United States, and some individuals from the Nipmuc Nation. And then finally, um, why Hunger has been providing a lot of the coordination for this process, uh, and that's, we've got Corbin from Why Hunger over here as well. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start this off. I, I'm your moderator for this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of int an introduction to La Via Campesina uh, and the global movement for food sovereignty and agroecology, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, Ian and Jean Simon to talk a little bit about their projects and how they're actually implementing the Campesino a Campesino methodology on the ground. So I apologize because I didn't have to be back and forth from the computer here. Oh, shit. So. <laughs> uh, well, why is it not working? Oh, I think this cord is a little wobbly. Okay, there we go. I'm going to touch it very, very gently. <laughs> it's on the stick. Oh, that's it. Okay, so why did La Via Campesina form? What is it? Um, La Via Campesina is a, a global network of peasant and small farmer organizations, indigenous people, fisher folk, and pastoralists all across the world. Uh, it was formally founded in 1993. Um, at a meeting in Belgium with representatives from four continents, um, including my organization, the National Farmers Union, was one of the founding members. Um, and it was a response to, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, the World Trade Organization, the, the IMF, the World Bank, um, and, and the globalization of agriculture uh, and financialization of agriculture that was happening around the world um, that was dispossessing peasants, forcing peasants off of land, and basically... Uh, you know, this, this globalized capitalist project um, forcing in policies of agri export agriculture all around the world. And so, you know, all of these peasant and small farmer groups started to recognize that this was happening at the global level, 
that it wasn't enough for us to just be doing advocacy for ourselves at the national and regional levels, that we needed to have a coherent process at the international level to, to address these, these issues from the grassroots. Sure. <laughs> so Via Campesina is the movement that first articulated the concept of food sovereignty, which I'm sure you are all, or I hope you're all familiar with. Um, you know, at the time, the dominant uh, narrative was around food security, right? And that's a very easily co-optable term uh, because you can say, you know, food security is just about having enough food to eat. And so that can be used as a justification for, you know, policies that promote the production of cheap food, right? Um, and so La Via Campesina worked together to come up with this terminology of, of food sovereignty, which goes quite a bit further in saying it's not just enough to have enough to eat. We need to have, it's, it's, food sovereignty is a fundamental right of all peoples, nations, and states to control food and agriculture systems and policies, ensuring that everyone has adequate, affordable, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food. And this is the most important part, I think, is that this requires the right to define and control our methods of production, transformation, distribution, both at the local and international levels. Yeah, thanks. So La Via Campesina nowadays, um, we, have about 100, we have 182 organizations in 81 countries um, all around the world. We collectively represent over 100 million peasants. I, um, I would say that that's quite a conservative estimate of the number of uh, peasants and, and farmers who are part of member organizations of La Via Campesina. Um, the VIA is a network of organizations and, and it has a criteria of being a network of grassroots organizations. So we don't have um, NGOs or, or nonprofits that are representing farmers. We have, you know, farmer and peasant uh, associations themselves. Um, so we work at the global level uh, to defend food sovereignty, the struggle for land and agrarian reform. Uh, promoting agroecology and defending local seeds and promoting peasant rights um, and struggle against the increasing criminalization of peasants and activists uh, that we're seeing really ramping up in, in recent years. So this is, um, this is my favorite graph. Actually, it's not, I hate it, but it's a really good tool <laughs> to explain um, what it is that we're fighting against and what, what, why we need um, agroecology to be a grassroots movement and to be a political project. Um, this graph is, shows basically the situation of agriculture in Canada um, with the development, the advancement of neoliberal agricultural policies that promoted basically a system of exclusively export oriented agriculture, which is, I'm sure, very, very similar to the United States and, and similar to a lot of countries around the world. The top, the top black line there shows the total output of wealth from Canadian farms, the total value of all of the products produced on Canadian farms, and the green, since 1926. And the green line down here shows the net farm income, so how much farmers are actually um, retaining of that wealth. So the gap in between, of course, is the amount that is captured by mostly transnational corporations, um, seed companies, fertilizer companies, all of that kind of uh, thing and so it you know this is kind of demonstrates that the, the the productivity has obviously increased and that there is a massive amount of wealth produced from our land um, and that the people who live on that land uh, uh, and who are actually producing the food um, are not retaining any of that wealth basically um, let me just uh, go back one actually so I think, I don't think I need to explain to everybody here what the externalities of this kind of capitalist system are in terms of human health and environmental degradation, um, food insecurity, inequality and exploitation, um, and, and the fact that this, this economic situation creates the conditions uh, that encourage the displacement of people from land, not just, you know, settler farmers in Canada, but peasants all around the world. Um, and, and, and that it's intricately tied into the systems of racism and patriarchy that, that hold up our current industrial food paradigm. Okay. So when we talk about agroecology from, from our movement perspe perspective, um, agroecology is not just a science. It's not just a set of technologies that we can use on our farm 
uh, to improve the ecological impact of our farming. It's, um, it needs to be a social and political project as well. Um, and agroecology is uh, a proposal for restructuring our food system from the ground up. It's, not, uh, it's fundamentally anti-racist, anti-patriarchy, and anti-capitalist. And uh, it is, it's, re it's re related to food sovereignty um, in that, well, in Levia, we often talk about agroecology being the roadmap to food sovereignty. And one of the, the sayings that we like to say is that food sovereignty without agroecology is just a slogan, and agroecology without food sovereignty is just a set of technologies. So we need to think about these things in, in tandem. So these are some of the principles of agroecology as defined by Levia Campesina. Um, this comes from the Declaration on Agroecology from our International Forum on Agroecology that was held in Mali in 2015 that I was fortunate enough to um, represent my organization there. Um, so this is, you know, was a very democratic process by uh, people representing all of these organizations of peasants from around the world to, that came up with this definition. So agroecology values ancestral forms of knowledge. It's focused on the community transfer of knowledge as opposed to the industrial paradigm, which of course teaches us that experts need to tell us how to, uh, how to grow food, and, and usually those experts are the ones that are trying to sell us things. Um, the Campesino a Campesino methodology, uh, these gentlemen are going to explain more about uh, how, that, how that methodology works specifically. Um, production practices need to be based on ecological principles, but we intentionally do not define what that means because we recognize that it needs to be rooted in local contexts and rooted in local traditional knowledge. Um, a sustainable food system looks very different in northern Canada and the Arctic than it does in, say, Puerto Rico, <laughs> in terms of what, what can be produced sustainably, what the community knowledge is, and, and what the culturally appropriate foods are. Um, agroecology requires that collective rights and access to the commons are protected. The people on the ground who need to feed their own communities need to be the ones who have access to land and seeds and water and, and territories. Agroecology requires self-governance by communities and the reshaping of markets. So we need, you know, it, it's, it's, again, not just about the production, it's about how uh, food producers and eaters relate to one another. It requires, you know, rebuilding transparent and shorter distribution chains that are just. And uh, finally, agroecology is political and requires um, a shift of power in our society. Um, and I think, hopefully, what I've said so far explains that one. These are just some graphics that we came up with uh, in the Farmers Union to, to visualize the difference between agroecology and the industrial food system. Um, so this is very much the capitalist food system, money being extracted at basically every point in the value chain by you know, seed companies, chemical companies, processors, food retailers, often which are all part of the same transnational corporations, right? Uh, and the farmer and the eater are the ones that lose in that, in that system as well as all of the externalities. And then the agroecological food system uh, creates du direct links between communities and farms um, and tries to close the, the ecological um, loops. So, it's okay, that's, that's all for me. I'm gonna let these guys talk now. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments at, at this point before we move on? We'll have like lots of time for discussion at the end, but I want to say that I think it's my turn. like we want this to be a discussion, and so we, you don't have to wait till the end if you have a, a burning question or, or um, something that you would like to interject. I have a question. Yes. Can you describe to me like exactly what, what your organization does, like physically, like on the ground? My organization. Yeah, like what you do. Sure, we do. Um, we basically exist. We're the only national organization in Canada. <laughs> The national, we're, sorry, we're the only national association of farmers in Canada that doesn't rely on corporate uh, money. Like we exclusively see? fund ourselves through membership dues. Um, and so we uh, advocate for policies that protect family farms and, and work against the consolidation of farming uh, in Canada. So the consolidation of farmland and also market control. Um, so we do a lot of policy research and advocacy work, um, but we also try to do work on the ground to connect farmers with one another to create um, 
projects that promote like solidarity economies and, and, and uh, provide farmers with the networks and the tools that they need to be successful. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Um, yep. This one. Presentation. The second. Okay, I think one. I'm the next one to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Ella, for this presentation. I've learned, I've learned about agroecology while you were speaking. So that <laughs> that shows that well, agroecology is a process, and we everyone are into learning process. Um, well, okay, blue screen. I'll take that chair for, for speaking. Oh, I forgot. There was one, actually one other thing that I wanted yeah, to say. Um, that, that this is, you know, we, we talked a little bit at lunch about um, agroecology as a, as a science, a practice, and a movement, right? Um, and, I, and I think that the movement in North America is really just beginning. Um, but we also need to recognize that there is a global movement and that it is actually quite advanced in many, many places and that we have a lot to learn from these other other movements and so you know that's part of our process um, and the work that we're doing in, the, in this group that I mentioned is is connecting to these these other movements in in places like Brazil and Cuba that have um, really advanced this work uh, and have a lot to teach us and so we're we're working to bring these lessons back to North America and advance the movement here and so we need to we need to connect with you know academics and people who are farming and eaters and, and like all of us together to develop this kind of shared analysis of what are the problems in our food system, you know, uh, from a practical perspective, but also socially, economically, politically, um, and work to develop a, uh, <laughs> work to advance, um, you know, this proposal that we've, if you agree with it. <laughs> Well, I, I can start talking about what's the goal of my presentation. I want to explain everybody here how we try to um, input agri uh, campesino a campesino methodology in the context of Quebec. So there's some specificity in Quebec that I try to explain and also I will uh, explain a little bit about what's our idealistic way of campesino a campesino, which means, yeah, well, for one. people that are not used to Spanish, it's peasant to peasant methodology. Maybe I can start by uh, saying peasant, uh, we use peasant term in a very strong and positive uh, way. Uh, I yeah, can refer good. to French to say that. This is working now. Oh, great. See. So this is peasant, peasant. Which means, like inside Paysan, there's the word pays, which is country. So Paysan are the people that build the country. They are the ones that occupy the land. And also, with that word Paysan, we can construct the word Paysage, which is landscape. So those are the ones that are building the world that we're living in. And uh, so this is really important for us, for La Via Campesina, and for all the organizations that are uh, inside that movement that we reclaim this terminology of peasant and that we that we be proud to, to, to say to people, yes, we are peasant, we're, uh, we're the one that build uh, the environment where you're living in, and we're the one that produce the, 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 the food that you're uh, eating. So, uh, well, I can skip to the other one. So this is a blank page. Uh, and This is a community. Well, I show you first the idealistic way of campesino a campesino. Uh, so inside the community, we will have uh, people, uh, peasants, families, and young farmers that are spread all around and that seems really happy in their situation. Uh, and at some points, those people don't really rely to each other because of the capitalistic way of producing food. Uh, they only sell their food to supermarkets or distributor, and they don't have any connection together. Uh, and oh, there's a special one. This one is a 
skilled peasant. So this person has some specific practical knowledge, know-how, uh, that are really efficient. And also another important thing is that this person has a way of explaining, a way of uh, telling things that are, um, well, he's a skilled communicator. Uh, so there are few of them, skilled peasants, we will call them promoters. Uh, well, three of them, it's enough. Okay. Oh, four of them. Okay. <laughs> There's also uh, this guy or women. Um, this is really important. And the methodolo methodology of uh, Campesino a Campesino, and this person is a facilitator. So this is what we want to create. We want to, um, we want to educate people to, to compete at that role. Uh, I will explain a little bit uh, more about the facilitator roles later. But for the moment, let's say that those people are looking for promoters, for skilled peasants. And they are people that know well their community and they have a political consciousness. So they are able to look to, to, to find those promoters and to create space for them to share their knowledge. So that, that promoter here organized a workshop with the, the help of facilitator so he can share his knowledge with other people peasants uh, in his community, S um, which is great because when knowledge is spread, it increases uh, the knowledge of everybody around. So let's say that this facilitator is really efficient and is able to create different workshops at different level and share the promoters are able to share different skills around their community. So oh, at some point in this, uh, idealistic way of doing things, if the facilitator has to disappear, well, it's not that bad because there's that network that is starting to be created. And it's not the way uh, usually institutions are working because it's more unidirectional. It's more like there's an expert and it's sharing information and the other people are learning. But in that, in that way of doing, well, the information are going both sides because, well, the promoter will, will receive people at their place, at their farm, and they will receive also information for their, from their, these people because these people that are smiling, they, are, they also have experiences which are all different. And this is kind of uh, magical. This one transformed into a promoter because he now receives some skills from two other promoters and he create a new new technique or a new practices that is uh, efficient and want to share with other ones. So this is the idealistic vision and also we can have people that transform into facilitator because they, they, they get involved into the process and they get, um, uh, they get, they get a more political view of what's going on and they want to be uh, into the action. So that's the idealistic, uh, and this is quite a model that exists in, to, in, na in nature to create network and to, well, this proved to be a very resilient system. So what's happened exactly in Quebec? Uh, we're right here. This is Quebec. Uh, we can see it, but let's concentrate to the south because there's not that much people living in north. And the, the, the blue dot is the, the it's my address. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, okay, it's also um, the, the address of the Saint Paysan because uh, we don't have any building, we don't have any infrastructure, we are really decentralized. Uh, so that makes our organization very low cost. And uh, let's zoom a little bit. Ooh. And here, the red dots are the workshop that we organized last year. Well, actually, this year. And you can see this, those dots all, all around big cities. Montreal, Sherbrooke, uh, 
well, there are few facilitators there, so that helped. <laughs> Ottawa and Quebec. Oh, sorry. So um, what uh, it it shows that like we really rely on facilitators to create some links in the communities and to organize workshops. Okay. Um, do I have something else to say about that? Yeah, only to say that well, all of our workshops that we organize are in the, uh, at the peasant farm uh, or in the kitchen or in the, like if we don't have space for, uh, if, the, if the promoter don't have space to receive the group, we can organize it in community centers. But the important thing to to say is that it's outside institutions. It's outside. There's no walls. There's no there's no building related to our activities. Is real and this thing is really important to say because it helps people to get uh, into practical uh, knowledge. We really want to share know-how, and we want the participant to go back their home and to be able to apply those know-how. Uh, in their situation. So, oh, I thought it was white. Uh, well, okay, we cannot see very well. So there's few challenges in Quebec that I want to mention before going in deeper details. Uh, there's a white territory and few people involved. Uh, so that makes it that makes it difficult to us to know the. The specificity of every community, that's why we rely a lot on facilitators' roles. And it's difficult to promote our workshops because we are really spread, so we need to have people active in every region to help us uh, reach the, the, the peasant in their communities. Uh, it's written here, consumers and individualism. Well, this is um, the idea. Uh, the, the predominant ideology of capitalism. Uh, we really want to go against that to get people involved and get people politic. Um, so it's, but at the moment, it's hard to get people involved because they are more into a relationship of, oh, I buy services and I receive things. But I, it's like simple solutions are often more attractive for majority, so we are not a simple solution because this is a holistic vision of what we have to do. And it's way easier for, for people to accept, oh, I've got some problem in my crops, so I put some herbicides or pesticides. So those are simple solutions, but in long term, that will create just more problems. So this is, uh, th those are challenges in Quebec, but Probably also you can relate to those problems when it's time to find solution to complex problem. Uh, sometimes simple solution don't really solve the problem, but just address, uh, don't just put a plaster over a uh, more deep uh, blister. Band-aid. Yeah. You don't want band-aid solutions. You want to get to the... Yeah. To, to the depth. Yeah. So how do we organize? Uh, well, we are really um, uh, lucky in Quebec because we have a strong cooperative law and we are registered as a cooperative. So that makes us clear governance uh, structure, which helps us. We don't have to discuss and write down everything to, to clarify our, the way we're working, the way we're, we decide, we make decisions. And this is also a very flexible law, so that makes us uh, being able to change and to tweak the different way we take decisions. Um, we also do a lot of work online, which can be a challenge because we don't see each other very often. Like the board members live uh, within a six-hour uh, six drive circle. So we do most of our meeting online, uh, which is a challenge for communication, but also is great for collective work when we can um, uh, all work together and, um, in the cloud. And that's, that helps 
us also to get people involved and do collective work. Um, so what we want to do also is to create partnership in every community. So we try to reach cooperative uh, because we have a, we are co a co a co op. Uh, it's easy for us to go see other cooperative and to have their cooperation. Yes. Um, and we also reach NGOs and grassroots movements or governmental institutions in every community to help us to uh, spread the world uh, and talk about the, the workshop that we're doing. Um, and in that idea, facilitators are very crucial because they are the one that knows those institutions or those grassroots movement within the communities which can help us. Um, what's written here? Uh, create, uh, organize, oh yes. We want to create tools and organize, offer workshop, but this workshop, it's a mistranslation. Uh, it should be formacion, it, which is a Spanish word that it's more about political training. So it's more about getting people involved, reclaiming their power, and being organizer in communities. Uh, so the tools and the formation that we organize is to empower facilitators in their different roles. Uh, we will see those tools later. So this is the structure of Centre Paysan. Uh, you can see that this is the member. We are two. 290 and well this is a, as a, a an image to see to say that this is hard to get people involved last year we only get gathered 11 people to our general assembly and it's probably because it's very very wide territory but also it's like it's hard to get to 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 get out of that consumers uh, mentality uh, we are about 15 facilitators from now, uh, and in, within those facilitators, there's people that are involved into the board uh, and also involved into the transfer committee. Uh, I will explain transfer, com transfer committee later because this is really important. And we have one coordinator, which uh, this person plans, do the plannings for um, uh, the workshop that we are offering. And the promoters, they are, some of the promoters are facilitators also. And what is lacking here is that we want promoters to be also in the transfer committee and also in the board. Uh, this is something that is critical for us because we want to have uh, diversity in every layer of the organization. Um, so yeah, that's it. So this is the board member, Hall's Mighty Face. Uh, at our last General Assembly, uh, this is me. Um, facilitator roles, yes. So the facilitators are, uh, first of all, they are delegate and uh, during the workshop. What that means is that they are the one that represents Centre Paysan and they manage all the logistics and like registration. Uh, they help the promoter to set up the space and uh, they also have a job to report back to the board and report back to the coordinator. So they have to be there uh, to take pictures, to write down a summary of what happened, and they also are there to um, facilitate the, 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 the discussion between the participants and the promoter. So what that means is that they, they have a a strong sense of what agroecology is, and they are able to ask questions or to ask clarification for people to, to be able to not only have a, a unidirectional exchange like what's happening now, but more <laughs> uh, question and discussion. Um, the facilitator can also be a board member. Well, I don't have to explain a lot about that but it can be also into the transfer committee. So that's now I will explain what it is. Uh, transfer committee is um, it's a group of individuals that meets maybe, that meet maybe uh, six, 
six times a year, and they receive a very clear uh, mandate. Is it the word in English? Yeah, mandate. Mandate from the board. So first mandate they receive. It's it's been two years that now that this is working. Uh, first mandate they receive was to uh, do an an analysis analysis of the workshop related to agroecology that happened in Quebec, and to analyze the price and the uh, to be able to, uh, for us, for the Centre Paysan, to fix our price and to us, not fix, uh, to, to, set. to set, to set, to set, yes, thank you, to set our price and also to set the, the promoters paid. Um, and now the transfer committee is working to, um, to share, um, uh, agroecological practices uh, survey to learn more about the communities, the needs of the communities. Um, so the facilitator also knows is or her community's need for agroecological know-how and his role or her role is also to share those uh, needs to the board members or to the coordinators so we can organize uh, meaningful training for them. Uh, and they have to search for uh, potential promoters. So while doing that, they need to know what agroecology is about. So they have to, they need to have a political consciousness of uh, the, the grassroots movement and they have to be able to explain it. So to, to talk about what's the advantage of joining the movement, uh, if they are going to reach some potential promoters, they, are, they have to be able to explain what the La Via Campesina is. And so this is something that we need to, um, to, to get better at it. Uh, and we're doing it uh, in uh, Formacion. So this is an example of formation that we held in Montreal. So, um, we were able to, um, to gather some facilitators and to share strategies about what we wanted to do. Um, so our tools, what do we have to organize? We have a delegate guide. So this is all the actions the delegate have to do during the workshops to do their job. And this is quite good because delegates right now are, are doing awesome jobs. Uh, we also have the transfer committee that really helps us to answer crucial questions. And also uh, the board members can delegate some, uh, some thinking to that committee. Um, so there's also the agroecological practices census, uh, the survey that I was talking about. This is really cru crucial because we want to offer for, uh, workshop that are really needed in every region. So, and we cannot be present in every region. So it's kind of, actually this is really simple. It's a list of agroecological practices and people are saying, yes, I do that on my farm or no, I don't do that on, on my farm or I tried to do it, but it didn't work or I want to learn more about it. So we have, around 15 uh, practices in every, like in production of meat, food, uh, vegetables, and transformation also, and also in uh, handcraft. Uh, the board member guide. So this is uh, some, a tool that will help us to have uh, new members mm -hmm. in the board and that they will be able to know what's going on. And finally, community facilitator guide guide it's in construction in, in construction and this is all about a facilitator role that i was explaining to you but doing draw some guideline of what we wanted to do so this is how we organize and that's it i think it's only images of workshop that we held um yeah I, think you have to have a I have a question for you. Yeah. Can you explain where you got this methodology from, the Campesino Campesino yes, methodology? Yes, of course. Well, um, 
I got it for uh, in I went to Cuba to learn with the ANAP, the Association Nacional de Agricultores Pequeños, uh, which they they have uh, they are doing that uh, methodology for years now. And I also personally have a background in popular education and in democratic education. So that makes a lot of sense for me to use that methodology. And like the tools really that we are implementing now are tools that they use in Cuba. Uh, so, but we, we transform them a little bit to, for the context of Quebec. So yeah, that's basically in Cuba. Yes. Can I ask how it's funded, or to what extent it's funded? Are people volunteering? Are people getting, you said some people get paid for leading workshops. Uh, how is the organization supported this financially? Uh, well, we got, we, mainly we got the money from the workshop we organized. Uh, from that money, there's a part that is to pay the promoter. There's a part that is to pay the coordinator. And there's a part to pay our um, normal fees like insurance, uh, general assembly fees, and transportation. And after that, there's no money left. But like it's because we are a really low cost uh, organization, we're able to uh, offer very low price for our members. And because we don't receive that much money from membership, it's only $40 and you're a member for life. So maybe we will have to change that because like, we are just staying poor and I, we have some limitation because of money. Uh, but basically it's, it's all uh, members founded. Bueno. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Pass it over to Ian. So I will be talking a little bit about the experience we have had with the El Josco Bravo Agroecology School of Agroecology. Uh, my excuse for my English is not my native language, so and I don't practice it very often, but I will try my best. Uh, the Proyecto Agroecológico El Josco Bravo is an agroecological project in which we harvest vegetables and we have a very strong component in which we harvest new farmers. That is the main objective of that component. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are representing here La Organización Boricua de Agricultura Ecológica en Puerto Rico, which is uh, the oldest and the largest uh, organization working with agro agroecology at the island which is also a member of the Via Campesina. Uh, it's pretty important to establish uh, the specific context of Puerto Rico, and especially Puerto Rican history, that uh, determine the situation of the agriculture right now. First of all, Puerto Rico is, uh, is an island located in the Caribbean Sea, it's a U.S. territory. Puerto Rico was invaded uh, by the U.S. Uh, Army in the, um, 1898. Uh, and that has determined everything in the island since, since then. Uh, right now, <coughs> agriculture represents less than 1% uh, of the economy of the island. And we produce from 10% to 15% of the total consumption of food in the island. So we are in a very vulnerable situation of food sovereignty. Uh, the colonial agricultural history of Puerto Rico has been based on the production of commodity crops controlled by big corporations. We have at certain moments, the sugarcane uh, monocultures, the tobacco monocultures, and the coffee monocultures uh, almost covered around 90% of the entire territory. So also, this uh, induced or provoked the displacement of a lot of uh, peasant, small peasant farmers 
that were dedicated to producing the uh, food, the Puerto Rican diet. Uh, in 1947, uh, we, have, we had uh, the Industrial Revolution, Manos a la Obra, that took a lot of peasant farmers from the countryside to work at the factories in the urban areas. Uh, and that provoked that at a certain moment in our history, the peasant, the Puerto Rican peasant, that we call los jíbaros y las jíbaras, uh, they were in a situation of risk, in risk of, of extinction. So we have established some key points that we have to address in order to achieve food sovereignty. We need a recampanización ecológica de Puerto Rico, una regibarización, a representation of the island. <laughs> uh, and why agroecology? Because we don't see agroecology as a market niche. We consider agroecology as a very strong weapon or the, the, the great weapon <laughs> to achieve uh, food sovereignty. Uh, we have to massify farming education. There's a big problem uh, with the access to land. There's a lot of young farmers like you that doesn't have a, a place to, to farm and also access to capital. <coughs> In the word of Pepe Mojica, which is the former president of Uruguay, he said, peasant farmers are only produced in the nucleus of a peasant farmer's family. El campesino solamente es producido en el seno de una familia campesina. So, in Puerto Rico we are facing a great challenge. How are we going to produce an army of peasants, an army of new farmers to achieve food sovereignty? So that's a challenge that we, in the Organización Boricua, and in the Hosco Bravo, have accepted. And five years ago, we launched the School of Agroecology of El Hosco Bravo, which has three, base, three main courses. The basic agroecology course, that is the most important course in producing new farmers. We have the animal power course and the advanced agroecology course. Uh, I will talk a little bit briefly about the animal power course and the advanced agroecology course and then I will be, I will go deeply in the basic agroecology course which is the most important one. So in the animal power course we teach students how to work with oxen. Uh, the oxen uh, is a sustainable practice in risk of, it, of disappearing along with the peasants in Puerto Rico. It's a peasant technology. Uh, and it's pretty important for Puerto Rico because of our topography. We have a lot of mountains in Puerto Rico. So a lot, uh, most of our, of our agriculture is going to be in the mountains. So in the mountains where a tractor can work. So it, it is still an appropriate tool for the hillside farming in Puerto Rico. This course uh, is a two-month course that is 100% on the farm. Uh, the Advanced Agroecology course is a curriculum designed for experienced farmers or former El Hosco Bravo students. Uh, it's a three-month course based completely on field visits. And it is important for us because uh, it is based in the in, linking peasant farmers with modern struggles, researchers, techniques, and technologies. We are creating links between farmers and different technologies that are already there, but maybe they don't know that they exist. And the basic agroecology course that in Spanish we call it Curso de Productores y Promotores Agroecológicos. It has three main components. It developed in one semester from January to June. 
uh, it has an intensive theoretical component. It has a practical component at the farm in which we develop a vegetable garden from zero to cooking our harvest. And a very important third component, which is the volunteer component, uh, where the student has to complete 50 hours of volunteer work at, a, an, at an agroecological farm of the island. There, are, there, are a list, there is a list of more than 20 agroecological farms in which the student can complete the 50, it's like an internship. So right now, we have three sections of the course that run simultaneously uh, at, the same, at the same time, of course. Uh, we have one, Toalta, that was the original one, uh, Guragua and Mayagüez. So uh, we have the intention to be present in every region of the island. In the theoretical component, uh, it is discussed a, a wide range of themes from the political context, the political situation of agriculture, the political situation of Puerto Rico, our colonial context, uh, plot evaluations, soil preparation, soil science, organic fertilizers, seed production, pest management, cultural practice, harvest, and food presentation, and a lot of other themes that, that are discussed in the in our theory com theoretical component. Uh, in the practical component that is based in the farming to farmer uh, methodology, it is very important that the facilitators are first farmers and then they are technicians or agronomists. In our case, the three facilitators of our course, of, of our basic course, are agronomists. But the most important thing for us is that they are farmers first than uh, agronomists. And in the volunteer component, it's like, as I mentioned before, it's like a farm internship. The students have to complete 50 hours of volunteer work. Uh, they can select from 20 agroecological farms around the island. So, for example, this year that we had around 100 students in our courses, we contribute with more than 5,000 volunteer hours that were, uh, that did a lot of work at the, at the different farms around the, the island and around the different islands, because we have uh, more than one uh, island. Archipiélago, ¿cómo se dice archipiélago en inglés? Archipiélago. Okay. <laughs> Puerto Rico is not one island, it's a group of islands. <laughs> so, uh, some lessons of Del Josco Bravo, we, we have had more than uh, seven and 750 applicants in five years, in these five years. There's a growing, growing generation of young farmers very interested uh, in agriculture but spe specifically in agroecological farm and other ways to produce food. Uh, our courses are free tuition. We suggest always a donation, but it's completely uh, voluntary. Uh, in these five years, we have produced around 250 new farmers. So we have contributed significantly for the Puerto Rican agroecological movement in these five years. 52% of the students that we have had are women, 80, 88, uh, 45, uh, 48% uh, uh, men. Uh, the average age of our students is around 32 years old, that mainly uh, young people. And this has been possible because of a strategic collaboration that we have done through the years. Uh, we have done a strategic collaboration mainly with ecological farmers that receive our students in, a, in the volunteer internship. Uh, we have done a strategic collaboration with the Natural Resource Department, with the University of Puerto Rico, and different activists and grassroots organizations. 
la organización boricua. Eh, if we we have waited until having the perfect conditions and having all the resources to start, we haven't <laughs> even started yet. So this has been possible uh, because of our will <laughs> to work hard for Puerto Rico uh, and the uh, Puerto Rico food sovereignty and the different collaboration we have, uh, we have done. So this is some of the phases of our students during the, during the last five years. This is the first uh, group of students in 2014. 2015. 2016. Camille is student of, El, she was student from Nejos Cobrao. <laughs> this is a special moment because the machete is a very symbolic uh, tool in Puerto Rican history. It's a symbol of struggle in different struggles around the around our history. On 2018, that's the future of Puerto Rican food sovereignty. That's all for now. Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, it was a very intentional decision by La Via Campesina when, in, the, in the early years because when we were developing the, um, I mean, I wasn't there at the time, but when, when the movement was developing its structure and, and, and kind of um, that there was NGOs that wanted to join, uh, and it was a very intentional decision to create a structure of, you know, that members in the movement would be direct rep like directly representing peasants, uh, and that NGOs could participate as allies. Um, and there are many NGOs that participate as allies and, and that support this work. Um, well, maybe not many, but few, a few. <laughs> um, and specifically can bring funding a lot of the time, which is really important, but it's the NGOs that recognize the importance of the farmers and peasants leading the process that, that are productive in their participation, if that makes sense. Yes. Sure. So the question was, um, in case people didn't hear about about coalition building and, and how we're doing that to connect with eaters and and uh, um, and grow the movement. Um, and I think that uh, well, first of all, we have a whole session on that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. At what time? I don't know. The People's Agroecology Process, which is the network that I mentioned um, at the beginning, is is running another session tomorrow at 3:15 to explain more about that that process within the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada. Um, of, of kind of connecting with each other and building alliances. Um, and it's, I would say, something uh, fairly young. It's been going on for a few years now. But something that's been really valuable for us is not just coalition building within North America, but through La Via Campesina, building the relationships with movements in other countries and, and having people who are now participating in this process having had experiences going to Cuba and, and, and you know, all over the world to learn from peasant organizations in other places, um, that that's been really important for our developing our, our methodology of how we operate here. Um, did you guys want to speak to that question at all? Well, uh, <clears throat> I can say uh, that th those relationships uh, at an international level are uh, solidarity uh, relationship, which means that everybody involved in those relationships put themselves in the learning position, but not only as people that, uh, because most of the relationships that are within NGOs is, are more very, uh, most of the time, very occidental centered, which means that um, rich countries go into poor countries to show how to do things, but this is now how it's working within La Via Campesina. Uh, I think uh, uh, rich countries have a lot to learn from the solutions that are uh, built in to uh, uh, other countries all around the world. So this is very empowering for everybody that are involved into that, into that process. Yeah, and I guess I would just add too that, that it's important that that coalition building be done through grassroots processes and, and not through some kind of you know, institutional, like, I'm going to link this and this, and you guys have to work together now. Like that a lot of our success in working together has come through um, kind of organic relationship building um, and then starting to work together because we have that basis of, you know, like friendship and, and solidarity. But that's really important. Yeah. Um, so, yes. okay, I'm from Puerto Rico, and like the idea that I had of agroecology was very specific to that context. Um, and now I'm doing a, an apprenticeship here, and I'm going to be here for a year at least. And I don't know, uh, for me, there is this difference uh, definitely in what agroecology is in the United States, in this context, and in, this, in the history of this, uh, the United States in itself. And I was just wondering, because, um, for example, we're talking about having um, promoters and facilitators, and 
for me, I, it's difficult to see the links in this context, recognizing that the, most of the workers are, are migrant workers and are also uh, in the history black folks that have experienced a lot of trauma. And um, I'm just thinking if there are conversations in La Villa Campesina to address those specific contexts in like specific areas, you know, if, cause there's this model for like um, um, South America and like the Caribbean and also I think that the context of the United States and Canada uh, with the situation of colonialism and the displacement of indigenous communities is real and is there like conversations about how we also uh, uplift those communities in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thinking of who are the campesinas, campesinas uh, or like the peasants in the United States and, and Quebec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a piece of paper at the back telling me to repeat the questions for the li live stream. So just, <laughs> the question was about context and, and you know, how, um, uh, what conversations are happening about, you know, agroecology in different contexts and, and with farm worker communities and racialized communities in the United States, for example. Brief summary, yeah. Um, does anybody else want to respond to that too? We have like a number, uh, I, I, I mean, we have a great diversity of participants in this process in this room that I think would be, well, yes, I, Ma Maureen, maybe? Yeah. I work for an organization in Bellingham, Washington, that's called Washington Over Murder. Oh. I work for an organization called Community to Community Development in, the, in Bellingham, Washington, on the border of Canada. Um, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. It's a farm worker organization, a farm worker justice organization founded by um, Mexican farm workers who continue to be the leadership of the organization. And the agroecological application in our region, in Whatcom County and Skagit County, is uh, actually fairly similar to the El Josco Bravo, that there's um, uh, farm workers who are um, who have been working in the, in the migrant agribusiness corporate system, who have uh, determined both the strategies of unionizing and cooperative development as like economic liberation, but agroecology as cultural, like the holistic liberation, the, the ability to liberate um, their families multi-generationally, like the knowledge of their ancestors. And the strategy has been that they have just acquired 65 acres of land or they're in the process of purchasing through a lease to own um, transition and that that will be a teaching school, Campesino the Campesino directly, uh, for, um, for other farm workers in the movement, the farm worker struggle in the Pacific Northwest to organize amongst themselves. And they have, uh, through the other organizing efforts they've done in, a, in the boycott um, against Driscoll's, which uh, was in, the, 2000, uh, the 2010s, um, and through the development of the Farm Worker Union, they've been always promoting the vision of the world that they want to live in based on their immediate experience of having suffered the consequences of pesticide exposure and exploitation and abuse in the system. Um, so they, they have re created those relationships with groups in the Northeast, the Southwest, the Midwest, um, about what their land project will be, and it will be a teaching garden for both cooperative development, farm worker struggle, and, and unionizing and agroecology. So it was a long-winded way of saying that they're leading a movement that's cent centered on land. The, they need land as a site to be able to do the teaching because the teaching is by doing, and agroecology is a, an applied experience. Um, and so the, their entire struggle has led up to this point to have land to be able to do an agroecology school with other um, migrant workers, undocumented domestic farm workers in the U.S. Yeah, I would just add too that the kind of the beauty about this campesino, campesino, or farmer to farmer methodology is um, that it it applies to such a diversity of, of communities. You know, like we're doing we're we're starting a process in Canada to to do this work with conventional farmers in, in the Canadian prairies who are you know, farming grains on thousands of acres. And, and it's the same kind of process where farmers uh, 
can begin to think about changing their practices when they can actually see somebody doing something differently with their own eyes, you know, like they, they don't necessarily trust when somebody says, oh, you do this and you'll be more successful. Um, but when they can have a process of peer to peer education, uh, that that's, I, I think the most effective way of, of providing that, you know, ecological and political education. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. Are there any other questions or comments? Mainly from Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. And are folks who are not from Ireland welcome? Yeah, of course. The question was whether folks folks that are not from Puerto Rico are welcome to participate in, in the agroecology school there. And yeah. Because of the of, of being there two months, it yeah. taking the course. Or is it like an investment that everyone like is in the same mindset that like it's an investment for you and your land to learn something? I'll just repeat the question quickly. The question was about the like the animal power course, for example. Ian said it was a two month course, and and your question is about you know what about campesinos who have to earn money and can't afford to take two months off? Like how yeah. does that accessibility work? Okay. Uh, uh, all of our, of our courses have uh, been designed to meet just once a week, one, one, one day a week. Because of that, because of our, a lot of our students, they work or they study at the university. So the three courses that we teach at the Los Cobrabo School of Agroecology, they meet uh, on Fridays uh, or Saturdays, the entire, the, the entire day. Yeah for the people to have time to, to work and make, make their life, yeah. Okay, I think maybe we have time for one last question. And, and 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> We've solved it. <laughs> Here. Uh, one last I, question. Do you have a question? Yeah, no. oh. Um, I just wanted to clarify the the methodology is like that you localize the context um, of what you're teaching in terms of the practices that you recognize the leadership of the people who have the closest relationship with the land and that it's um, honoring their culture and the land that you're on and that it's the food that you're growing applies to the those who eat it in a way that's like safe for their bodies and for the soil and for the community so while the the concept of having land to do the work on is integral. The way the, the campesinos in Whatcom County do the work is in their own teaching style and their own teaching practice with their own indigenous languages and their own tools. Um, so it doesn't, when I say it, it resembles this, I mean it resembles it in the sense that it's on land. Um, but the way the land looks is totally different, not just because we're in a different, um, ecological climate, but because of the way that they naturally um, construct a finca, so a farm. Okay, thank you. I, I think we need to wrap it up so that um, they can do some evaluations here. I'm actually just wondering quickly, maybe if the people who are part of the people's agroecology process want to just stand up quickly so that folks in the room can see you, because we're all going to be here for the next three days as well. Like I said, we're running a session tomorrow. Um, but, you know, if you have any further questions after this session, any one of us is you know, able to, to talk or, you know, if you have ideas or are interested in getting involved, uh, please come to talk with us. Thank you. Yeah.